What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and astrology is the practice of predicting the future by studying the movements and positions of stars, planets, and other objects out in space. Depending on who you are, it may be a bit of a controversial subject being that every time it's ever been tested in controlled studies, it's shown to be inaccurate with no scientific validity whatsoever, but I'm not here to talk about that. As long as you're not hurting anyone or encouraging reckless behavior, like telling someone to bet their entire life savings on black because they're a Capricorn, I don't have a problem with you believing that flaming hot balls of hydrogen and helium millions of miles away can have an impact on your personality. Just don't ever tell me that Mercury being in retrograde is a valid excuse for shitty behavior and I won't have to deliberately miss when I use the bathroom at your house. What does interest me about astrology though is the stories behind the constellations. Whether you're an Aries, Virgo, Gemini, or Sagittarius, chances are your sign has some pretty weird history to it and that's what we're talking about today. With the new year being upon us, I thought now would be a good time to launch this new mini-series where we explore the mythology and astrology that cultures all around the world believed in for each month's respective astrological sign, starting with Aquarius. Little did I know that Aquarius is the second to last sign in the official astrological order, but we're just gonna power through that. So for those completely unfamiliar with astrology, Aquarius is a water sign that's active between January 19th and February 18th according to most calendars, which places it between Capricorn and Pisces. It's also one of the 48 constellations listed by the second century astronomer Ptolemy, meaning it's one of the oldest recognized formations in the zodiac. It's usually represented by a vase that's pouring steam or water down to Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish constellation, not to be confused with the Pisces constellation, which is larger and represented by two fish instead of one. You can find Aquarius in a region of space that's known as the sea due to its high number of constellations with water associations, like Cetus the whale, Pisces the fish, and Eridanus the river. But where does its connection connection with water come from? Well, the name Aquarius is Latin for water carrier or cup bearer, and these names are derived from the various myths associated with the constellation. In Greek mythology, it's sometimes connected to Deucalion, the son of Prometheus. He built the ship with his wife Pyra to survive the Great Flood. Other times, it gets associated with Cecrops, the first king of Athens who sacrificed water to the gods. But the myth it's most often associated with is the abduction of Ganymede, which stars everyone's favorite polygamist, Zeus. So remember that guy we talked about a few weeks ago, Eric Thonius. He's one of the first kings of Athens and was born after Hephaestus prematurely nutted on Athena's thigh and she wiped it on the ground, which impregnated Gaia. Well, his grandson is Ganymede. Random connection, but I thought you'd find it interesting. According to the myth, one day Ganymede is tending his father's sheep when Zeus catches a glimpse of him and is struck by his beauty. Then he either summons an eagle or turns himself into one, grabs the boy, and brings him back to Olympus, where he enlists him as the official cupbearer of the gods since Hebe was relieved of her duties after marrying Heracles. Now Ganymede's father Tros, who just so happened to be the founder of Troy, wasn't happy about this at first, but Zeus compensated him with a few divine horses and pointed out that Ganymede was now blessed with eternal youth immortality, and a distinguished role in serving the gods. After this, Tros made peace with the idea and was even proud of his son for attaining such a high rank. When it comes to Zeus and Ganymede's relationship after this, we're still not totally sure if there was a sexual component to it or not. Him being struck by Ganymede's beauty certainly seems to imply that, but scholars have pointed out there isn't a single other example of Zeus giving immortality to one of his side pieces, male or female. There is a theory that he may have actually been attracted to Ganymede's mind because his name can literally be translated to taking pleasure of the mind, and that's why he wanted him as cupbearer, so he could consult with him at his own convenience. But personally, I don't know if I buy that one because Ganymede's like a 15-year-old boy, and who would possibly take advice from someone in TikTok's demographic? Anyway, there is actually another version of the story where, instead of Zeus, Ganymede is kidnapped by Eos, the goddess of dawn, and brought to Olympus. After which, Zeus steals Ganymede from Eos because if he didn't, what would stop the other gods from bringing up every mortal they think is kind of cute. But since Ganymede had now seen the home of the gods in all of its glory, he couldn't possibly be sent back to Earth, so Zeus gave him the job of cupbearer. Honestly, I kind of like that version a bit more, but to each their own. Now, what's really interesting is that there are astronomies from cultures besides the Greeks that also associate these stars that make up Aquarius with water. In Egypt, the constellation represented the annual flood of the Nile, because the banks were said to flood when Aquarius puts his jar into the river, thus beginning the spring season. And in Babylonia, 
Babylonia, Aquarius was identified as the Great One and represented the god Ea, who is commonly shown holding an overflowing vase. Only to the Babylonians, that vase was associated with the destructive floods they experienced on a regular basis, so they weren't exactly happy to see it in the sky like the Egyptians were. Not everyone associated these stars with water and flooding, though. In China, the water flowing from the jar is actually referred to as the Army of Yulin and represents soldiers coming from the northern reaches of the empire. Isn't it crazy how creative people were back in the day? All they needed was a few glowing dots in the sky and they could make an entire religion out of it. It makes me wish I could go back and experience what life was like back then. Besides all the death and disease, I love me some penicillin. But that solo fam is everything I've got for you today. Thanks for watching another episode of Messed Up Minute that was of course longer than a minute. If you enjoyed it and learned yourself something, be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons because I will be doing these every month for the rest of the year and you do not want to miss it. I'll see you all again soon in a full length episode of Messed Up Origins. Until then, my name is John Solo and remember, John shot first. Thank you.